Hello, and welcome to our training, What Administrators Need to Know About Family Engagement, Part 1. My name is Kim Jenkins, and I am joined today by some of my colleagues from across the state, Tara Cowley, Catherine Poggi, and Jennifer Geibel. This training is being recorded and will be posted on the Family Engagement webpage of the Patton website. We will be utilizing a poll and the chat feature. We encourage you to participate in the activities throughout this presentation. The mission of the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistant Network, or PATN, is to support the efforts and initiatives of the Bureau of Special Education and to build the capacity of local educational agencies to serve students who receive special education services. Here you see PATN's commitment to the least restrictive environment. Our goal for our goal for each child is to ensure individualized education program or IEP team teams begin with the general education setting with the use of supplementary aids and services before considering a more restrictive environment. You might ask, why is family engagement so important? Family engagement is a component and can be found in each of these documents. They contain examples of the necessity of family engagement within the law and standards for education. The Individual, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act requires improving results for students with disabilities. <clears throat> IDEA, IDEA also requires all states to develop a state performance plan, or SPP. SPP indicator eight measures the percentage of parents with a child receiving special education services who report that schools facilitated parent involvement as a means of improving services and results for children with disabilities. ESSA is a plan in Pennsylvania designed for annual meaning di differentiation through a nationally recognized stakeholder engagement effort that includes educators, parents and families, and policy and community leaders. Pennsylvania's accountability system and school progress reporting will provide educators, parents and families, and other stakeholders with clear and meaningful reporting on both school and student group performances, as well as the ability to identify and act upon act on opportunity gaps. The Daniel Singe framework, specifically domain four, professional responsibilities component C, focuses on communication with families. In order for teachers to demonstrate competence in this area, proactive, frequent, appropriate, and two-way communication with families is paramount in um, addition to sharing information about the instructional program and student progress so that families can share in the learning process. Pennsylvania's System for Principal Effectiveness, Domain 4, Professional and Community Leadership, Component 4A, focuses, focuses on maximizing parent and community involvement and outreach. The school leader designs structures and processes which result in parent and community engagement, support, and ownership for the school. Here you see an example. Um, this, this is the ESSA Parent Guide. And um, ESSA, again, was signed into to law by President Obama in December of 2015 and governs the United States in K-12 public education and policy. Um, this guide from the U.S. Department of Education helps parents understand ESSA. Some of the ESSA mandates you will read about in this document include the requirement for every state to develop challenging academic standards, an accountability system for all public schools to improve student achievement and support systems to assist schools in reaching that goal. ESSA also requires states to obtain input from parents and families as they create state plans. Um, there will be a link uh, put, posted in the chat where you can have direct access to this guide and we encourage you to share it with your families in your LEA. Here you'll see our agenda for today. We were going to look at uh, definitions for family and family engagement. We'll share a little bit of the research and also share with you some strategies to help you improve uh, your family engagement. Right now, I would like you uh, to just take a minute and if you can type in the chat a brief definition of what you consider a definition for family.
Okay, some of the things that I'm com seeing come in on the chat are, the unit that provides support, the unit that supports and cares for a student, good. A unit that supports and cares for students, again, the support, um, support members for a student, anyone that comes together based on bond in the educational setting of someone raising a child. And this, the chat is just exploding. There are so many, um, I'm not able to, to get, read all of them, but, um, another one is people in the household who support a child's well-being. Yes. A unit living together. Absolutely. Um, extended support system. Mm -hmm. A group of people loving each other and doing life together. I like that. Um, people who support um, and are a cohesive group. My family is any person who cares for a student, right? And there are so many more. Thank you so much for entering things into the chat. Um, another one, the group of people that provides the basic needs of a student. Ways to connect with families or the school community and support families, okay, and learning and their development. a parent and the child living together as a unit. Thank you. There, I appreciate everyone's response. There are far more many in the chat than I'm able to get to right now. But I like that there are many things to think about when you think about a family and many types of family to think about. Um, and I hope that you will you know, take um, all of these things into consideration when we um, talk about the types of different families and the families that are represented in your LEA. Okay, here on this, this information was provided um, on the Love to Know uh, website. And I thought they did a nice job des describing all these different types of families. Some that, um, I know many of these were listed in the chat, but maybe some other ones that you haven't considered. Um, have you considered okay, the nuclear family? Um, includes the parents and their children living in the same residence or sharing the, and they share the closest bonds. We also have the extended family. And this family includes all relatives in close proximity, such as grandparents, aunts, uncles, and cousins. Um, they may or may not be living in the same household, um, but they may share, um, all share in duties and, and share responsibilities with raising their children. We have the complex family. This type of extended family has three or four or more adults, plus the children living in the same hold, household. Uh, this family may be formed through divorce and remarriage, or it may be formed um, in other um, manners. Some of these families may be complex, um, even without formal legal bonds between the adults. Then we have the single parent family. Um, a single parent family could be the result of the divorce, a death of one of the parents, or even a single parent um, adoption. Step family. It's a family where the adults have divorced and remarried, bringing children from other unions together to form a new, a new nuclear family. The children may come from several different parents um, or be on one or both sides of the new union. And we have a traditional family as defined in the classic sense as the father and the mother and the children um, in the, within the family. And this definition of family um, is, is not as common. I mean, many, many years ago, um, traditional families were considered the norm. And in this day and age, um, traditional families are less of uh, the norm there because there are so many different types of families, um, different families that may be living within your community. And then we also have the adopted family. Um, this family shares legal bonds, but not genetic uh, bonds to their genetic um, you know, bonds to their children. Um, and then again, the last one on the list is the foster family, um, which may include one or more adults, parents who serve as a temporary garden, guardian for one or more children to whom they may or may not be biologically related. So as you think about the families in your um, LEA and in your community, please remember that there are many different types of families that might exist and they all bring a variety of different things to the table and they all want to um, the best for their children. Okay, multiple roles families play in building learning pathways. 
this comes from this graphic comes from the Global Family Research Project. Um, and just as there are many different types of families, there are also so many different types of roles that families play in their child's education. Some may be very involved and others may not be able to be quite as involved. Um, if we look at this graphic, um, some of the things included in here are uh, parents that might be partners with the educators and working um, with the parents may be working with the educators to fully implement what's going on in the classroom and to share that between home and school. Um, parents may be teaching, teaching their, their children, um, not only what's happening in the classroom, but also teaching other things um, to the families. Parents are co-learners. They are learning along with their children and beside their children sometimes um, and helping to support them. They're advocates for their children. They're decision makers and may analyze data and things that information that they receive back from the schools. They are definitely negotiators with their students and it possibly with their um, with their, their education staff, the school staff. They volunteer, they may be networkers and community builders. Um, they may be advisors, monitors or coaches. So these are all different roles that families may um, play when in educating their children. But what can you do to, do to assist your parents to build the learning pathways? We'll, we will talk about strategies a little later in this um, presentation, but you wanna be able to identify parent leaders and ask them about their concerns. You wanna empower parents and develop a working partnership with them. You wanna share your perspectives and your information. You wanna make sure you build your trusting relationships and um, really involve them in what, what's going on um, in school, throughout the school. School leaders must commit to ensuring that all families and community, communities build equitable learning pathways for their students. This commitment may demand a shift in mindset from devaluing parents or just not thinking of parents in the same way and, and really valuing, now, valuing them and building a trusting relationship with them. Family engagement promotes equitable partnerships among schools, families, and communities to actively advance student achievement through shared commitment, decision-making, and responsibility. Family engagement might require a shift in mindset of families, teachers, and administrators. Increasing the family engagement at your school starts with you leading the pathway to work with your staff and families to co-create strategies that work to achieve mutually agreed upon outcomes for children, families, and school. Families working together, families and schools working together because our students are worth it. Children are the priority, changes the reality. Collaboration is definitely the strategy. When parents are engaged and involved in their children's success, their children's grades go up, they attend school more regularly, they are more likely to enroll in higher level programs, they're more likely to graduate and go on to college, they are more excited and positive about school and learning, and typically they have fewer issues inside and outside of class, the classroom. Schools should be exemplars of a welcoming environment. In order to create a welcoming school community, administrators and educators within the school community must embrace several core beliefs of family engagement. First, they must recognize that all families have dreams for their children and want the best for them, even if those dreams may not be what educators themselves might identify as important. They must presume confidence in each family's ability to support learning in the home with the right scaffolding. Administrators and educators must also think of families as stakeholders and equal collaborative partners who, virtually, who vitally contribute to their, education, their children's education. Additionally, school staff must be willing to take on um, the oneness of cultivating and sustaining relationships between home, school, and the community. Administrators play a vital role in establishing a culture of welcoming and mutual respect. Okay, at this time, I'd like you to just participate in a poll. Um, which of these statements best describe your LEA's family engagement?
have, we've got people have responded in all of the different um, statements. So now next, what we're gonna do is take a look at how you've responded, what that, what that shows um, relation, in relationship to family school partnerships. Now, the, these are some versions of the family school partnerships. In the book, Beyond the Bake Sale, the authors describe four levels of achievement regarding family engagement at the school level. The descriptions of each of these versions of family school partnership, um, here they're seeing from left to right, the least desirable to the most desirable. So for those of you who answered, um, your answer was C, that is, that statement is an example of a fortress school. And this is one that does not maximize parent energy as a strategy for improving student achievement. It's closed off from the community. Um, families are not welcome as welcomed in these schools and may be blamed if there is a problem. So if you, you answered C, I challenge you during this, um, this training to think about the things and the strategies, strategies that we're presenting. We, we're hoping to move you down um, the arrow here to um, closer to partnership school. For those who answered um, B, um, this is what we call come if we will, or come if we call school. And um, this may um, value the idea of tapping parent energy for the purpose of improving student achievement, but hasn't implemented the idea into actions. It may offer, you may offer workshops on parenting, but um, otherwise uh, you provide little, maybe little opportunity for partnerships or communication. In this model, it's believed that families can only contribute so much. And maybe they're not, you, you, they're invite, invited in for some things, but not other things. If you answered A on the poll, that statement relates to an open door school. And an open door school is focused on tapping parent energy for improving student achievement. It also tries to increase community ties, celebrates cultural differences, and sends home regular progress reports. Um, but partnership may be limited and not necessarily equal in, in an open door school. If you answered D, this, is, this statement um, re relates back to a partnership school. It's the ideal school. This is what we're trying to create and trying to help you um, strive and build um, your current practices to get to a level where you can be called a partnership school. Um, it, a, a partnership school um, consciously and conscientiously taps parent energy for improving student achievement. Families are included in every way possible and are celebrated for what they, for what they have to offer. Some questions you might ask yourself, um, where does your school fall on this continuum? What are you currently doing to make improvements? How can you sustain improvement? And what level of trust exists between school personnel and family members? How can you capitalize on that trust? And what can you do to earn it? So I'm just gonna take a, a, a quick break here and check with my colleagues. Are there anything else coming in um, on the poll or chat or uh, questions? I'm sorry, in the question box or um, chat from any questions or any comments? No, it looks like we're good to go, Kim. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Okay, some challenges in family engagement. You could say, well, some of the things that, that we hear is that we don't have enough time um, we're not really sure how to engage families. We're just not sure where to begin. Um, there are many, many different types of challenges, and, and these are ju just a few represented here. I'm going to ask you if you can, if the, right now, post in the chat, um, what are some challenges that you personally your, and your LA, LEA are facing related to uh, family engagement? 
Okay, right away, COVID. Yes, I see that. There are language barriers. Transportation and technology, parent work schedules, online schooling as due to COVID. Well, we offer programs and activities and parents don't show up. Okay. Incompatible schedules. A HIPAA concern. Parent families trust in the school. Financial or internet issues, lack of resources. Parents unable to attend. Okay. Time for families engaging workshops or engagements as they need childcare for their children. Okay, so definitely childcare can be an issue um, for parents attending school functions. Staff has fixed ideas. Um, parents not showing up or ignoring calls. History of negative relationship with the school. Yes, remember that parents their previous, their own education may, and, and what they've experienced may affect how they respond to school. Their own, you know, the challenges that they face when they were in school um, may be reflected in their attempts to feel comfortable um, in working with the school, uh, with their children. Okay, trust, family's not motivated. Parents are working during the school day, yes. These are all, yeah, thank you for your responses um, to your challenges. And one of the things I'm gonna challenge you with a little bit is to think, if you offer professional, if you offer things and parents aren't, um, aren't attending, whether any kind of functions at a school, it could be things designated for parents, it could be, you know, um, just parents having activities that where they can support the school, um, and parents aren't showing up. And if you're, you keep offering and you keep offering different and variety of things, and they still don't show up, I challenge you to to rethink first um, building a relationship from the very beginning, starting that with that positive relationship, building that first, um, taking a look at that, and maybe as a reason behind. Um, why parents maybe aren't feeling comfortable or aren't participating because just offering activities isn't enough. Parent and family engagement is so much more at that. That is only one small component of um, building those trusting relationships and getting the participation of families. Again, because all parents want their, um, their children to do well in school. So, um, you know, building relationships in addition to offering all these, the activities that you offer them is as a key component of increasing your family enga engagement. Um, seeing also custody issues. Yes, I, I can imagine that that is, is, is a very difficult, can be a very difficult issue and barrier for um, family engagement. Okay, um, now I'm hoping, again, thank you for everyone who's posted in the chat. Um, I'm hoping that we will be able to share some strategies with you in a little bit that will help you um, build your family engagement. This next section that we're going to look at now is just to give you a little bit more behind um, the research, what the research is telling us about family engagement. So with that, um, I am turning the presentation over to uh, Catherine Poggi. Thank you so much, Kim. And if you're comfortable with still advancing the slides, that would be fantastic. I loved that the comments that were shared in the chat really align with the research that we're going to be talking through. And this very first slide that Kim's going to project connects to valuing all students and their families. And with that, I, it was the notion of respect that was most highlighted. There is a book and there's a saying that goes with a book that fair is not equal. And that book is The Red Pyramid by Rick Ryderin. And he really poignantly states that fairness does not always mean that everyone gets the same. Fairness means everyone gets what they need, indicating that it is detrimental to treat all children 
you know, with the same mind's eye that we're meeting them where they are. And we need to make sure that we're looking at everyone from a different perspective and a different background and meeting them exactly where they need to be supported. Other things that were shared through the research with that are captured on this slide. We really want to have the mindset and the message that we value all of our students. We must respect their families. The strategies that are listed on this slide are also endorsed by the research by Henderson et al., which we have captured at the bottom of the slide. A couple other things that we wanted to highlight are the fact that we want to value all families, and to do so, it's really important to gain knowledge regarding their backgrounds. So recognizing and including their cultural elements and demographics. In addition, engaging in contextual teaching by connecting learning to those backgrounds and being respectful of that. Connecting with their community resources and being mindful of what their neighborhood context and some of the resources right there in their backyard consist of. Providing information to support learning at home and really you know, fostering that partnership that we have the same expectations across home and school. I don't think anyone could have anticipated COVID as being much of that in our daily lives. Additionally, they have suggestions around offering interpreters as necessary. We're so thankful that they're with us today. And recognizing the different modes of family support, which again, I really think endorses what Kim just walked us through. We also wanna make sure that we're further examining strategies in which the families may engage in their children's education in supportive ways. And a couple of the things, the very next slide allows us to kind of elaborate a little bit on that, is that the research from various studies allows us to see positive effects of family engagement on student success. And it's showing that students have much to gain by having family members that are active participants in their education. They have much more confidence and their self-esteem is reported to soar. We also are seeing better social outcomes, social skills and behaviors. And those behaviors are more likely to help us to move towards graduation, which is certainly prioritized and the necessary next steps for after high school. There are a couple really great research articles and things that we'd like to make sure if you wanna further your thoughts around that. And one is the website, the American Psychological Association. They have a site and an endorsed article, Parent Engagement in Schools. There's also some great resources that are connected to Grand Rapids Public School District. And then a few connected research studies are attached to that. So this slide really just highlights the benefits, the things that our youth are more likely to accomplish. And with that, we want them to grow up and to be successful adults. So moving into the next slide, we are able to talk a little bit about the influences on family engagement. And again, I really loved the dovetails that Kim was able to interweave with our focus for this morning. One of the core beliefs of family engagement as introduced in some of the earlier slides is that all families have the capacity to support their children's learning. And that's everyone. They all have a gift and an expertise that we have to value. We need to also make sure that family engagement in education is shaped by a variety of factors. And those definitely include the family members' own educational experiences, their own parents' involvement, and their school experiences the beliefs that are shaped by cultures and values. Every school and family is different. As schools build collaborative relationships with their families, they will better support and be able to understand the family needs. And I really would like to take a moment there to just compliment what was captured in the chat because many of the comments reflected that. There could be past experiences that maybe weren't um, really supportive or felt to be well received that might be overshadowing some of the things that might be a reluctance to connect now. So I often say that's a problematunity where we can try to capture it and help out. So the very next slide that we're gonna move into is what we call our dual capacity framework. And this has been something that has driven much of our research and time within the Family Engagement Initiative. And it comes to us through Matt and Kutner. And there is a reference page that has been populated into the chat. I know Linda and some of our team members have put things in there. Thank you so much for keeping that in there. But the big components of this graphic that we want you to have as a takeaway is that the first is the challenge. 
The challenge is, as administrators, we want to make sure that we're being fully aware of any challenges for both your staff and families in building effective partnerships. And in that, that we can spotlight the shared responsibility for student outcomes. As we move down the continuum, the essential conditions connect to the research-based guidance. So the different resources that we're populating into the chat and also that are connected to the tiny URL that's affiliated with this presentation. Moving again down the continuum of the graphic are policy and program goals. The policy and program goals connect to outcomes for educators and families. So if we're all on the same page and we have the agreement, we're gonna be giving consistent messages to our youth. And then lastly, the capacity. The capacity outcomes pertains to how we can work together and um, how we can make sure that we are working from the capacity that we're making everyone feel comfortable, we're making everyone know that we can do this and we can do this together. And I just did see a flash on the chat. Yes, I did say problematicity and um, that was a deliberate comment. And I feel that is just a mindset of embracing the positives. It's a problem maybe from one perspective, but let's grasp it as an opportunity and let's work together to try to overcome that. So now we are at a graphic that allows us to further unify all of our roles. So we've got the educator challenges that we've talked about with the dual framework, and we've got the family challenges. With that situated right in the center is the goal or the problematicity, if you wanna just extend that. One possible goal for administrators could be to integrate capacity building and opportunities into school policies, programs, and practices for both educators and family members. We know that we can look at research-based guidance to have those partnerings be a mutual and a very successful respect-based continuum of, of collaboration. So the very next slide gets us into just a couple thoughts around essential conditions. And these essential conditions, again, link back to the research that's connected to this work and the dual capacity framework that Kim had up a moment ago on our slide. Basically, with this, we were able to describe two foundational components or essential conditions for success. These are required for effective family school partnerships. What we find from the research from MAP and Kutner are the fact that certain processes and conditions must be met for adult participants to come away from a learning experience, not only with new knowledge, but also with the ability and the desire to apply what they have learned. So we have to have both components in place. We also find that research also suggests important organizational conditions that may be met to sustain and scale these opportunities up. The two essential categories connect to processes that allow us to have a series of actions and procedures that allow families to take action with our schools. So the processes and the relational steps are built on mutual trust. When you really peel all the layers back, we want everyone to be on the same page. We know that we are in a safe place and we can work together to have that common goal. In addition, as we look at the, the graphic that Kim has on our screen right now, we wanna make sure too that we are linking things to the learning environment. Everything is purposeful and we understand that it is going to allow us to be able to work through things together. In addition, we wanna make sure that they are asset-based. So strength-based, asset-based, and it makes sense. So we're not doing things to try to think about how it links back and what was the, the purpose. Cultural responsiveness and equity is at our core and making sure that we have ongoing collaboration and interaction. The next slide allows us to go a little bit deeper with the essential conditions. And this is going to allow us to talk about organizational conditions. With that, a couple of the things that they have prioritized is systemic changes. And with that, those family partnerships, they must be systemic. In many cases, family engagement is not part of the long-term strategic goal for our schools. Therefore, cultivating family school partnerships are not always viewed as a priority. We hope that today's webinar will allow you to change that paradigm and for us to be able to purposefully work together and design core components and educational goals. 
In addition, we need to make sure that family school partnerships are integrated. In many schools, family engagement is considered an option or a non-essential practice. Again, I applaud the comments that were put in for the chat because many of you shared that experience. We want to make sure that we can shift from just, you know, a day-to-day -day operation to actually purposefully integrating. And with that, if we can have teachers and job descriptions and different things that are overlapped that have us purposefully engaging with our parents. We also want to make sure that we're shifting from that add-on perspective to actually something that is integrative. And with that, if we have families and we have folks that are working together and they are, you know, in an integrative overseeing type of role. So they're actively at the table during decision and process making. Another comment that was shared connected to this slide is that family school partnerships need to be sustained. So when changes are really put forth and prioritized, often they are linked with funding. And we wanna make sure that we're not just leaning on short-term grants or things that might have a, a finite timeline or that monies could run out. We want to make sure that programs are among the first to be prioritized and that are linking family school partnerships that can be sustained over many years. And also to make sure that we have adequate staff and resources that we're continually growing the capacity at the building level, at the administrative level, and our staff level to maintain that if we have different things just that routinely happen with attrition or different folks that might be moving in and out of their job role. So moving on to the next slide, we're going a little bit deeper with the policy and the programs. And this one is just really, again, emphasizing the four C's. And the four C's that are captured are the fact that we wanna really prioritize our capabilities, our connections, our cognition, and our confidence. A couple of the takeaways that they had connected to research is the fact that capabilities is the administrator, educator, and staff need to know their students and families well. That breaks down to rapport, knowing our students, knowing their needs, and being able to be an active support with that. Additionally, the connection component, C number two, that's the social capital, or what we often talk about with relationships. What we really do is build relationships, and those relationships create safe spaces that our learners feel comfortable to learn. Staff and families need to access and be able to go through the social capital with social and strong feelings of cross-cultural acceptance, trust, and respect. These networks are recommended to include family-teacher relationships, parent-to-parent -parent relationships, and connections with that community relationship and agencies that might be connected with those services. What we find with that again is if the school and the administrator really know the community and the resources that are there, they then can really make these braided partnerships. The very last bullet on this slide connects to confidence. And that confidence is probably best described as self-assurance and self-efficacy. We wanna make sure that family school partnerships that are built around confidence allow them to work through things that maybe in the past felt less secure or maybe things that um, if a child had an academic need that now we can respect that perspective and we can understand that both the educators and the family members are working together to build self-assurance, to build self-efficacy and to build the necessary relationships to help that student be able to have success. There's another C that we've got captured on this slide and it connects to cognition. Cognition is the assumptions, beliefs and worldviews so a big takeaway with that would be developing capabilities and connections and confidence that the assumptions and perspectives are able to be transformed. So, you know, I look at that again as a positive, or if I use the same term, a problemutunity. We may have had difficulties in the past, but we now have raised our understanding and we have the ability to make an effective change. So the next slide gets into a little bit more of capacity outcomes. What we have is two columns that are captured on this slide. And this again shows the tandem connection of education and educator, excuse me, empowerment and family engagement. This also is a direct tie back to the dual capacity framework 
that we had depicted at the beginning of this research, research section, and that was the graphic. That described the desirable outcomes that will result from sustained commitment and our ability to develop individual and collective capacity together. I love that. Effective partnerships that support students in school improvement by working together. When we are able to do this, educators have the important takeaways of feeling connected with their families, feeling connected and engaged with the families as co-creators, being able to know that they have family funds and family knowledge bases, things that are important to them. And then also the families will have the very valued role and takeaways of feeling that they are engaged in a diverse set of roles. So their role is no longer just coming at it from a parent perspective, but they too wear the hat as the co-creator, being a supporter, taking on the role of a, mon a monitor or a mentor, depending on the task, being an advocate, and without understating a very powerful model. The next slide, gets into a couple of the benefits. And again, you know, so often when we work through content, we think about what's in it for me? Why do we do this? What would be ways that we could best support? And the teacher benefit takeaways are captured here. We wanna make sure that all parties are feeling included. We wanna look over this list and see if there's anything else that you may wanna add, because we recognize that your own setting may have individual nuances. So the increased ability to elicit understanding, that again is the partnering and the relational component. The increased diversity and in use of communication with families. This I believe would be a capacity building that we are growing our own skills, our own skill set, excuse me, of understanding our stakeholders. The awareness and ability to communicate clearly. So having respectful norms, having different things that we can work together to make sure that we're being supportive of each other. And lastly, but never the least, increasing appreciation and making sure that we have that network component in place. Now, the very next slide, as you would indicate and expect, would be benefits for our family students. And this is just as equally important. So with that, we wanna make sure that we are increasing the perception of school quality and just that acceptance component. I, I personally love it when I walk into buildings and I see the posters, you are welcomed here, we're so glad you're here. So having that be a purposeful message, making sure that we can ease the interactions and communications with schools and teachers. That I think connects back to the earlier slide where we have parents that are operating as mentors and models, sometimes even really powerful liaisons to build those relationships. The students, we wanna spotlight our youth at all times. So making sure that we have awareness of their progress in subjects and skills, knowing any actions that may be needed to maintain or improve their grades, and making sure that we can work through those communication steps to remedy any needs at the earliest point. And that, I believe, is the conclusion of that section connected to the research that's behind our dual framework in the research and families. Okay, I'm not seeing any, so we will move on to our next section, uh, Family Engagement Strategies, and this is uh, Tara Kelly. Good morning, everybody. Um, so in this next section, we are going to talk about some strategies to increase family engagement at your LEA. And before we get started, um, I just actually wanted to start by saying thank you to all of you for the work that you are doing. Um, I am also a school administrator. I was for many years prior to joining Patton. So I have a unique appreciation for the job that all of you are doing. And I know that oftentimes um, you are not the people who get thanked, your amazing staff who are working so tirelessly on behalf of our students throughout the Commonwealth, have done an amazing job this year. Um, but I wanted to take a moment just to say thank you to all of you, because I know that it is not an easy task. It's oftentimes a thankless task. So thank you so much for doing everything you do every day and for showing up um, for your staff and for your students and your families and for professional development opportunities like this one. 
So we're going to get started um, today with a quote from our sixth president. And um, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, then you are a leader. And that was from President John Quincy Adams. And I think really that's our goal, right, every day when we come to work is to try and do that for all of the lives that we touch as school administrators. So on this next slide, we're going to ask you to take a moment to think about what have you as an administrator done to promote partnerships with families within your LEAs? And we're going to drop the link to a Google document into the chat. So if you'd like to access that and um, take a moment to contribute some of your thoughts, um, that would be great. And just to note everyone, we'd like you to fill out the first column. So this is what you have done as an administrator to promote family partnerships. After we go through this section on strategies, we're gonna ask you to rethink this and to select maybe some strategies that you might wanna use in the future. And that's when we'll fill out that second column. So uh, stick with the first column for this moment. Thank you, Dr. Eibel. Yes, I apologize for not clarifying. Um, and I do think this will be really helpful. So on our next slide, um, we're gonna start taking a look at who are the actual stakeholders in family engagement. So the information in this graphic was actually adapted from an engaging stakeholders document that was originally developed by the Department of Education to illustrate the importance of involving families in increasing student reading outcomes. However, we felt that it does a really nice job of breaking down the stakeholders of family engagement in general into their constituent groups. And then it describes what's at stake for each in having families centrally involved in their child's education. So as you'll see at the top of the pyramid, of course, are the students, right? Having their families involved in their education increases their likelihood of success throughout school as well as their future opportunities. Then as we know, after the students themselves, families are the next primary stakeholders in their child's education. Being centrally involved allows them to have input into their child's school community, support their success, and increase opportunities for their child both throughout their education and into the future. Then for teachers, paraprofessionals, related service providers, and other school staff, partnering with families allows them to increase their professional efficacy, better tailor their instruction and service to their students' needs, and enjoy a better sense of collaboration and job satisfaction. So as administrators, we know that we stand to gain so much from making family engagement a priority, right? In addition to enhanced collaboration between school and home, resulting in increased outcomes for our students, we also have the opportunity to develop authentic relationships and partnerships with families, and they really have so much to contribute to enrich our school's culture and community. This can allow all of our stakeholders to have a sense of ownership and pride in what's being created and achieved by our students. At our district and LEA level, family engagement provides increased accountability, an opportunity for positive media relations, and alignment with mission and vision in many instances. Then for our taxpayers, family engagement really results in increased student outcomes and higher quality student communities and quality school communities, sorry about that, which helps them to feel as though they are getting a good return on their investment for their tax dollars. And many families, including grandparents, are taxpayers, so that's a win-win. Then in the business community, we know that they are in need of a well-educated, skilled workforce. So engaging families in their child's education increases the chances of graduating students with the skills that they need for their 21st century workplace and beyond. And then finally, family engagement provides the community at large with a sense of confidence and pride in the quality and outcomes of their schools, as well as enhanced real estate values, a better sense of quality of life in many cases. So in short, really there's so much to be gained from family engagement and making that a central daily part of our practice. So on this next slide, we're gonna take a look at developing a checklist for building family engagement. It's a little bit of a roadmap. And we're going to put into the chat a link so that you can access this document. And what is the first step that you can do as an administrator to increase effective family engagement or partnering in your LEA? 
So you might want to consider something like this. Prior to beginning the school year, you could develop a checklist of family engagement activities that you're committed to accomplishing during the school year. And if you'd like, you can use this sample to consider your own checklist. Would you keep all of the listed family engagement steps? Headings can include developing a job description of your family members as it pertains to education. So working with the families every year to develop a school family compact, clarifying how families can promote learning at home and in school, clearly identifying how school staff will support families, you know, really having those expectations really clearly laid out is very important, building a buddy system to pair experienced family members with newer arrivals to the school community, inviting families from different cultures to share their values and traditions, asking families to describe how they speak to their children about education, listing ways that families can promote education in the school handbook and on the district website, and sharing information regarding the role of family members during open houses, virtual tours, and other events. Another header could be building family confidence in their ability to help their children. Really, we want all of these things to become positive self-fulfilling prophecies, right? So offering workshops in a variety of ways, both live and online, to build family skills, providing materials and information in a variety of ways, sending home learning packets, educational games, and links to virtual videos and learning games, inviting families to observe in the classroom so they can see how lessons are taught, asking families for information about their child's strengths and how they learn, and engaging family members in discussion at parent-teacher conferences rather than just presenting the information. And then another section could look at making how we can make sure that all families feel welcome. So consider holding virtual or live home visits to build personal connections, providing information again in a variety of ways, both online and on paper, making personal phone calls home to invite families to contribute information or attend events, invite the entire family to meetings and events, holding smaller meetings in neighborhoods and community centers to build that sense of community, surveying families about how they would like to be involved, and researching communication types that are preferred by the family. This is very important. It's gonna bear on one of the sections we have later. So would you add other sections to this? Remember that ultimately you should engage families in the decision-making process to decide on a focus for the school year. And we're, again, we're gonna have more on that decision-making later. So on the next slide, so we're now going to watch a video and this is a video of Jamie Miller, who is a parent who lives in a school district on the Eastern side of Pennsylvania. And we're going to ask you to listen how she shares how she is partnering with her school and especially what they've been doing during the pandemic. While you watch this video, please take a moment to jot down a phrase or something that Jamie says that may resonate with you about what family engagement can look like. And then when the video is over, if you could, please take a moment to share your comment or your thoughts in the chat. You'll wanna listen for things like how the Miller family is collaborating and communicating with their child Nate's IEP team, including his related service providers and how that partnership has extended to the current virtual learning environment. So we're gonna go ahead and watch the video and then we'll take a look I at I think another chat. positive is that the virtual learning is making our IEP team even better and more cohesive. Um, since I'm present with them at school and I'm acting as their hands for Nate, we get to work more closely as a team um, and I feel more empowered, more equal on my role in the team. I've always felt like we have a good team and I've always felt comfortable and like, you know, a respected partner on the team. But now I really feel like I'm you know, truly an equal. I feel like I'm one of them. Um, I'm seeing them daily. I'm talking with them daily. The PCA, the special ed teacher, the related services, we're communicating all the time. Um, you know, I'm doing whatever they say. I'm adjusting the camera angles. I'm grabbing whatever book they say or whatever manipulative or piece of equipment. And I'm setting things up to their instructions and I'm, you know, doing whatever they say. Um, so we can give and get constant feedback from each other, which has been great. Um, you know, we're problem solving as a team, we're troubleshooting together. 
Um, I'm telling them what's working and what's not. I'm able to ask them for help to make it better. I'm giving them suggestions for my, what might work. Um, and then I feel like we also, as parents, are able to demonstrate our parental expertise of Nate by showing this is what we do at home. Look, this is how I would do this problem with him and look how he was able to solve it. Um, so he can just, you know, demonstrate live for them what he does for us at home when we support him in that way and they can see, oh, wow, that really worked. It's not, you know, it's not just parents saying that, that it worked. We're really seeing with our eyes, we're working together with Nate and seeing, um, you know, that using the three dice of five helped him count five, 10, 15. He got that easily when, you know, when we phrased it three times five, he didn't get it, but doing it this way really helped him. Um, so I feel like that's been a great way to help really, um, you know, show that we're experts on our own son and help show them what he can do. Um, and then they can replicate that at school, even after remote learning is over, they'll know that these are strategies that work for him. Um, so I feel like we're just increasing our already good rapport that we have on the team, our sense of collaboration and mutual respect and the shared goals that we have for Nate. They've given us frequent, open, honest communication. They've been partnering with us, listening to us, um, really trying to make it clear that they want to make it easier for us, that they're here for us, that they, you know, don't want to have any kind of burden on us. Um, the support has been wonderful. Okay, so if you could take a moment to drop into the chat um, a thought that you had that popped up while you were watching Jamie's video and her description of how she and her family have been partnering with Nate's IEP team uh, to support him during virtual learning and how they've been collaborating and communicating. Okay, so there is a question that's popped up in the chat that asks, what grade level is this? This is an elementary school student who is in middle elementary school. So we're seeing lots of comments, frequent, open, and honest communication. All parents of all backgrounds are indeed experts. Positive parent language among educators is crucial, absolutely. Joy, comfort, and empowerment, constant communication. Keywords that she used were empowered and equals. They are collaborating together and supporting each other. Equal member of the team speaks volumes. Expert on my own son. Yes, absolutely. These are key, all key terms. And the family has been encouraged to feel that they are part of the education process. Yep, we're seeing lots of key terms here. Collaboration, communication, empowerment, equality, family expertise. Absolutely. They feel, the family feels valued. Absolutely. They feel heard. Yep, these are all words like they were here for us. Respect was the baseline. Wow, these are really great observations, great pieces of feedback. Thank you. Extended family involvement partnership. Yep, absolutely. So, you know, another another takeaway from this video that, um, you know, we've heard sometimes, and, you know, and this is absolutely valid because a lot of us do work in school settings where, you know, people might say, well, this is not always possible in all situations. You know, not every family only has one child with a stay-at-home parent who is willing and able to be able to support their students learning all day, every day. Um, some people have said, well, you know, the students that I work with are more complicated. And the thing that we want to share is this did not happen by chance, this situation with the Miller family, and it did also not happen overnight. Um, this was the result of many years of 
uh, sort of perfecting that communication and that relationship, lots of trial and error. And Nate is a student with multiple disabilities and has several challenges. So um, he's definitely a student who has a very complex learning situation. And this can happen, and it is happening. And it's happening with a lot of planning, a lot of mutual respect and collaboration, two of those key words that you all just highlighted so beautifully, and a ton of communication. And it absolutely is ongoing. It is open, very transparent, very respectful. And there is that real sense of everybody being equally invested in the process. So I think you all hit on that so beautifully. And on that note, I am going to turn things over to my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Geibel. Hi, everybody. Great to talk to you today. So Tara just shared a lot of really excellent points with us about how family engagement is a process. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that we can develop um, quickly at an afternoon meeting. It is something that takes many years of building mutual respect and rapport between school staff and the families in which you, the families which you serve and who attend your schools. So one of the things we wanted to make sure we pointed out today was how important the role of the school leader was within family engagement. As we all know, you as school leaders wear many, many hats. And this is no different in the realm of family engagement as it is in, in anything else that goes on in your building. You as school leaders play many roles in building school home relationships. The first thing that school leaders do is they teach that respect for your families and your community at large and recognize the significance of family engagement. Um, we also need to communicate its importance to others and inspire others to increase their own abilities to engage in respectful and equitable ways. As school leaders, you all serve as models of expected behaviors. You challenge others to live up to expectations for family engagement and homeschool partnerships, and you engage multiple stakeholders in collaborative decision making. So we saw that slide earlier with all the different stakeholders on it. That list could almost be endless if we really dive deep into it to see who is involved in the education of children. School leaders recognize the importance of all of those stakeholders and involve them in the important day-to-day -day decisions of the educational entity. Effective school administrators don't leave these relationships to chance. Again, Tara mentioned how much planning went into developing that relationship between Jamie Miller and her school. We need to initiate relationships. We need to plan and implement systematic and, and pervasive measures to establish successful whole homeschool relationships. So in this section, we're going to talk about how all these roles of the school leader associate with the how-to of family engagement. And we're going to give you some functional strategies on how to establish successful family engagement policies and practices. So one of the most important things we can instill today is that family engagement needs to be proactive. It should never be an afterthought, this building of homeschool relationships. Instead, we should consider family engagement at the foundation of educational programming. And this begins by ensuring that it's included as part of the school's general planning, whatever that looks like. Uh, mission and vision statements are common bedrocks for educational programs. It's something that we establish early on. These statements help define the purpose of schools and set the direction of you as an LEA. As administrators, it's definitely within your scope of practice to ensure that family engagement is discussed when establishing mission and vision statements as well as school goals. And this is something that you want to consider a grand opportunity for engaging families to contribute information throughout this process. Um, what families can you get on board to provide information about their thoughts as far as mission and vision statements go? And you should consider whether you have participation from a variety of individuals who are representative of your school community. When you have decided on mission and vision statements within your LEA, you need to share them with your families and do that often. It's easy to forget or, or stray off the garden path, if you will, sometimes if you're not reminded of what you're trying to achieve. 
So emphasize how much you value the school's mission. Instead of just crafting these statements, though that's important, we need to also be strategic in how we inform families of what they are. So keeping families abreast of mission, vision, belief statements, goals, sharing the progress that's being made towards what you're trying to accomplish. That's really important. We should also reference these elements often in communications in order to increase family awareness and connect family engagement activities to school goals as well. This allows families to be active partners within the school process. Making these connections also promotes the understanding that the school is actively working towards family engagement and that we're addressing the issue via tangible, productive, and practical activities. Okay, we're going to take a moment to kind of reflect upon your own mission and vision statement. So, so let's take a, take a think, I guess, into what you already have in, in progress, what mission and vision statements you already have going on. Um, and let's put this in the chat. Is there a reference to families within your mission and vision statements? And what might that be? Uh, did the statements within those mission and visions, um, do they emphasize partnership with families? Do they make families feel they are needed and valued? Consider how we can include families within those existing beliefs that we have already created and published. So I'm seeing a couple of things in the in the chat. Let's see, we're emphasizing partnership with families, helping families and individuals with life-changing needs. Oh, I like that one. Um, some of you are saying, we, we got to work on this. We got to revisit it, uh, keep working on it. All right, working together to ensure every student succeeds. Oh, vision. here's an example of a vision statement, to be an accepting community that unlocks students' abilities to discover and reach their full potential. Excellent. Uh, relationships, responsiveness, results. So I'm seeing lots in here. Um, and I love you guys too who are saying, wait, we haven't yet included families, but we need to, uh, because that's why we're here, <laughs> to figure out how we can do that. Um, so I love it. I love what I'm seeing here. Uh, shared values, student success comes first. Uh, programs that encourage and facilitate the cultivation of educational partnerships. I love it. That's great. Um, okay, so some of you are saying we've included society, we've included community, but maybe not that, that buzzword of family specifically. Um, you know, which might be okay too. It depends on your LEA input for all. All right, I'm seeing such excellent ideas. So as we move forward, keep reflecting upon these little, um, you know, thoughts that you're having about how we could include families more in mission and vision statements. As we go through this series, we're going to give you opportunities to build upon that. Um, let's see, we also have seen that uh, we believe the responsibility and benefit of education is shared by families, schools, students, and the community. Great. So we have a lot of, of great ideas there. Um, just going back one second to the previous slide. When we look at our mission and vision statements, you it looks like you've found lots of ways to include families in them, or you're thinking about ways we can include families. That's our first step. But we can't stop with mission and vision, right? We have to implement family engagement across all school policies and procedures. So we need to think about how can we instill family engagement as a part of daily life within the school rather than a specialized activity. So sometimes we feel like thinking about family engagement as in, okay, maybe an event at the school in which families might attend or may not. Um, but instead we need to move beyond that to everyday education and how we're doing our best to include families because family engagement looks different for everyone, right? We have families who may never come to the school and that could be for a variety of reasons, but in the end, it doesn't mean they can't be engaged families. We need to welcome all families as equal partners 
and require others within our system to do the same. So that means our entire staff should be required to, to look within themselves and figure out how can we engage families in partnerships. We also, as always, need to respect the diversity of our students and families and examine their cultural biases. So examine our own cultural biases. We might have a vision of what we feel families should do within our school, but that does not mean that that's a vision that's shared by all cultures. So when we think about our own beliefs in family engagement, we need to recognize that others may have different feelings. We also need to provide families with opportunities for training, interaction, and collaboration. Now, this doesn't have to all look the same, does it? We were talking a lot at the beginning about those challenges of engaging families. And one of them that came up a lot was, oh, we're not getting families to come into the school. And that can absolutely be something that you guys are dealing with on a daily basis. But in that case, we have to think, what are other things we can do to provide training, provide interaction, provide information or opportunities for collaboration without requiring the parent to come into school? So I do have to say, you know, I'm a single mother. I have three kids, one of whom is in special ed. I work, obviously I'm here. It is hard to get to the school for some of these activities. I just can't do it. It doesn't mean I can't be involved, but we have to find some new ways to think outside the box. And then we also need to recognize and utilize family strengths. All families have strengths, all communities have strengths. What can we do to uh, actively think about what families can be providing and what they are providing? on an everyday basis for the education of their children. All right, when we look into identifying practical strengths, all families, like all students, have strengths. We have to look beyond our own biases to identify them and inspire our staff to do the same. We talk a lot, especially in special education, about the importance of identifying strengths for our children, right? Whenever we're writing an IEP, we make sure that we have listed all the things that the student is doing really great at. Then that's very important because we build on those strengths, right? They are a foundation to which we can achieve more. Um, so this might be the most important belief that you can instill within your school families is that families also have strengths in which that maybe in the ways they interact with their children, the ways that they provide uh, support for their children. Um, family engagement is every day, every hour. They are part of all learning experiences at every level of the educational process. And we have to extend that expectation that all families are welcomed and respected as educational partners. Additionally, you might need your staff to reflect upon their own expectations for their families their own cultural biases, their own um, ways, you know, that they believe families should interact and to encourage them to fully value the diversity within their school populations. Family strengths should always be recognized and celebrated, even when, or especially when they are different from our own. Right, so looking at those practical strengths, we can find several of them within our families, can't we? Um, we have families who might have shown resilience and adaptability in the face of challenges. We have families with fantastic social connections, whatever those might be, connected to their churches, to their community centers, to their cultural centers. We have families, all of us, and I feel all families do this, that love and appreciate their children. <laughs> they want their children to succeed. They want them to be able to have a good life. All of our families help and encourage their children. They have knowledge of their children. So what was it that Jamie Miller said, that she is the expert on her son? And isn't that true? Because regardless of the time that we are spending with children, families are spending a lot more time with their kids. So they are able to provide us with information that we otherwise might not have. Um, we have strengths of communication, the ways they reach out to us, whether they are families that gravitate towards using means like say texting um, or communication via the phone versus families that might 
be into email. We have families also that their strength is that they demonstrate responsibilities to their child. You know, they follow through on what they're supposed to do, whether that's going to work, working double shifts so they can put food on the table. Um, they are showing their kids how to work hard and be responsible. Families appreciate safety and care for their children, right? They provide those things their kids need, whether it is medical care, hugs, whatever might that might be. And then also time together as a family is also a great strength. So I would like you to take a moment as we look at this list, consider the strengths of your families. Are they maybe families that show resilience through hard work or the ways in which they cope? Do they demonstrate an ability to roll with the punches? Do they have strong social connections with strong extended families? Go ahead and put in the chat what you think are some of the great strengths of your families within your LEA. Maybe your families are really excellent at assisting their kids with homework or even just by texting the teacher to tell them that, hey, this homework was too hard and, and we couldn't get it done tonight. <laughs> Ah, okay, so we're getting some some con contributions to the chat. Our families are strong communicators. They support their students' special education goals. They're appreciative, resilient, safety and care communication. They know their child the best and relay this to the school team for collaboration, social connections, knowledge of child. They make sacrifices for their children, time, finances. That's an excellent one. Hardworking, strong advocates. Uh, resourcefulness and solving problems, love that one. Active participation along with student for live and guided virtual lessons, excellent. Uh, communication is always a great one. Social connections, time together, love and appreciation. And we had uh, someone now say, I like that one, make sacrifices for their children. I love that too, because all of our families do that. Um, oh, families who are really good about talking to their kids about their daily work. What a great one that is. Way to engage families directly in academics. That's fantastic. Okay, excellent. Um, holding their children accountable. I like that one. And diversity, great. We should always find strength through our diversity. Excellent, thank you so much. One of the things that administrators can do most importantly, besides recognizing the importance of family engagement, is saying the right things concerning families within their schools. So when we think about our job as administrators, we are the leaders, right? We are the role models for our staff. So anything that we say may be uh, used by others, right? <laughs> We are the models. So we need to seek not only to do, but to also say things that are going to promote family engagement. All individuals who are educational leaders, be they, they principals, special education leaders, superintendents, you have power. And that great power is that you can present the expectations of what you want your staff members to perform within your school, because you're the heartbeat of the whole school. You establish school culture, you promote collaboration, you emphasize unifying relationships. So it's really important you model positive verbalizations when speaking about students and families within the community. So comments like, our families don't value education, uh, it's just the way things are here, or this community doesn't care, are typically detrimental to building relationships. And they might ultimately cause the failure of whatever your best laid family engagement plans were. So we need to um, go ahead and 
make sure we are phrasing our words positively towards families. We have to promote the strengths of our families and community and require their, your staff members to do the same. Uh, comments should always uplift homes and communities and not drag them down. In the event that a staff member does produce a negative comment concerning families or communities, the administrator should approach that staff member and engage them in conversation to re-script the comment by considering the positives and the strengths inherent in that family, in that school, in that community. This is one case where if we simply ignore negative statements, that indicates acceptance of negative statements. Um, so it's one of those things that we can't just kind of brush it aside. We do have to address it. And we have to provide another way that educators can, can make their statements. Um, it's not to say we're not going to recognize that there are sometimes challenges, but we want to make sure that we put that in a light that always emphasizes families as collaborative partners. So I noticed that we had someone mentioned in the in the chat, I have had administrators that modeled negative language towards families, reinforcing negative language like difficult families. Yeah, oh, touchy situation, right? Because that means that we are putting the onus of these engaging relationships on the family and basically saying that they're a challenge that we can't get past, right? And that is never true. Um, instead, we need to rephrase in, again, a positive light, recognizing strengths, finding all the ways that families are doing awesome things within our school or our community, because there are always so many of them. And we had a statement here, the language we use shapes our culture. Oh, absolutely. Now, I'm a little biased in, in this case because I'm a speech language pathologist, so I, I value language so highly. Um, I always emphasize how important it is for all of our stakeholders to have a voice and um, to be able to communicate. Language is the basis of our culture, definitely, Casey, and we need to institute positive language in order to uh, uh, move on and achieve great things. building trust with families. So let's say you have gone through these previous steps we've talked about. You've included families in mission and vision statements. Um, you have built a culture in which staff members know they must value all families. They have to use positive verbal verbalizations with families. And now we need to build trust with families themselves. Everybody benefits when homeschool relationships are built on trust. And unfortunately, we see within our own work at the state level that families do not always have trust in school. And this could be because of perhaps experiences they've had before in their own education, experiences that their own children have had within the school. And it is hard to get trust back once it's lost, but it's not impossible. As school leaders, we need to embrace and model the belief that relationships are built on trust by being welcoming and genuine with students and their families. Being actively welcome might manifest itself in different ways. It could be as simple as just letting families know that they are welcome in the school building and greeting them when they arrive. Now this is hard, right? Because many of us have security and metal detectors and, and it's all for good reason, isn't it? To keep our children safe. But having that welcoming attitude our way, is one way that we can show that parents are, are not only recognized as being able to come into the school, but as, are recognized as partners. We can also do strategies like ensure that all signage is written in all the languages of your school or even opening up a family resource center to say this is a place where families can always come and can always receive something that they need. We can also gain the trust of the school by highlighting school successes, right? It's easy to talk about things that bother us, but what about the things that are going great? <laughs> you know, families can't be expected to place trust in the schools when they don't know what's going on there, especially when they don't know what's happening positively. Identify ways to communicate with families about both student level and school-wide accomplishments. 
sing the praises of your students at school board meetings, on local TV and radio if you have access to that, on social media pages, that's huge right now, and promote that message that your students, families, and your communities are special and unique because they all are. Demonstrate how much you care for your students and their families, even in the small things like learning a few words in the family's first language, that makes a huge difference. And ensure the families that they know who to talk to and how to get the help that they need it. So it shouldn't be a situation if a family wants to talk to you, let's not try to pass the buck to somebody else. Um, you know how when you call into a company and you get transferred to a million different extensions, oh, frustrating, right? We need to do the same with families, provide them with the person that really can help them. We also need to uh, look at, again, we've talked about this before, look at our own cultural biases in order to successfully respect the culture of others. So if we want our families to know we care, we have to show that we respect them. Be open and honest with your families. Don't ignore or dodge issues, but instead talk about them and let families know that their opinions, their cultural um, expectations, they're welcome within the school. We also need to know our communities that our schools are located in. So not all of us live in the communities where we teach or where we lead as school administrators, but we still need to be involved in that community. Strategies like home visits, community walks, and community mapping can increase what you know about your students and where they live. Being aware of community organizations is so, is so important, whether that's religious and cultural centers, sporting organizations. I know where I live, the soccer association is really, really important. Um, so the school is able to give uh, space for the soccer association. That's a great relationship they have. Volunteer organizations and any other important organizations within your community, your knowledge of them increases your ability to connect with the stakeholders that you serve. School administrators also can build bridges when they make themselves available to attend community events, even when they're not school events, right? So to be able to get out there and, and let people see you, kind of the boots on the ground type of activity in which you can get to know your stakeholders. And then we can also hold school events in community locations. And that was something I saw as I perused our list at the beginning. Remember, we had you write down things you're already doing to promote family engagement. And, and we saw that a couple of you said, we're going out into the community. We're going into community centers. We're meeting in the park because we know our families can't get to the school. Um, how great is that? You are already doing a lot of these strategies. So we're gonna see how those move forward um, as we continue on with this session. Oh, we also see, I just had a comment in the chat. We are attending community resource fairs. Fantastic, that is a great idea. As a administrator building trust within that school community is paramount. So um, everything that you're doing in order to build these relationships is so important. Um, you might want to, as, as you look at this further and as you're figuring out what strategies to use, take some steps to assess the level of trust within the, your school community, maybe by assessing you know, using an assessment tool, holding focus groups with multiple stakeholders, developing committees to think about how to build these relationships. Um, that's always a great idea. And recognize that building this trust is going to take time, right? It does not happen overnight. Okay, moving forward. Okay, thank you, Dr. Geibel. I'm telling you, she is just a font of knowledge and I wish she was on my child's team. That's all I have to say. Um, so Dr. Geibel just did a wonderful job of illustrating the importance of trust as the bedrock of relationships between our schools and our families. And we know that communication builds upon that bedrock and really strengthens the foundation. So as administrators, we have to always be prioritizing that importance. And, you know, it's, it's hard because we know in our day-to-day there's about a million and two things we need to get done. So having to keep this as a priority focus, you know, it gets tough at times, but it really is worth it. And laying the emphasis on frequent and ongoing communication is that necessary step to building an atmosphere of mutual respect. So communication needs to be provided in a variety of ways. And we alluded to that before, but now let's dig into this a little bit. 
So the provision of digital communication and digital resources is great for many of our families, but we do need to remember that not everyone has access to the internet and particularly high speed internet. And that's been thrown into sharp relief during COVID, right? We've really seen um, just how deep that digital and how wide that digital divide is. And additionally, not all families have computers. So necessary information should be provided in ways that are accessible via mobile devices. While it may seem like a contradiction to the previous statement, um, we do need to emphasize frequent and ongoing communication. It's also very important to remember not to inundate our students and families with unnecessary information. So for example, families who have multiple children, they may be receiving multiple email blasts regarding the same information, and that can get a little overwhelming. And at some point, especially with our parents who we know have so many competing priorities, they may just stop looking at messages completely. So it's very important to work with our tech departments to ensure that each family is only receiving the messages that they absolutely need. Additionally, we want to make sure that, you know, not every family needs every piece of information that's being disseminated by the school. So we need to be very strategic and selective in what's going out. So for example, while it is useful for all families to know that the district's going to operate on a two hour delay on Wednesday, it may not be useful for every family to know that on Tuesday night, middle school vo girls volleyball practice is going to be canceled. Maybe not everybody has a middle school girl who plays volleyball. It is also important to remember that all individuals tend to read shorter amounts of information. So if we can say it in 10 words rather than 200, let's do that. When presenting information, we want to make sure that it is available in all the languages that are pertinent to our school community. And to assist with this, administrators may want to provide training to educators and families on how to use translation apps. Now, it's important to note here that, you know, translation apps are great in some instances, but for things that are formal and legal documents, it's very important to have quality translation service. So in order to secure that, administrators can look to join translation and interpretation consortiums, which often allow us to obtain these services at a more inexpensive rate. And providing all languages also includes providing access to sign language interpreters at both school events and private meetings. So when we're looking at our websites and all digitally provided information, we need to ensure that they meet web content accessibility guidelines. And you'll often see this abbreviated as WCAG standards. And we're gonna delve more into accessibility in just a moment. But perhaps the most important element of communication is the attitude that goes into interaction. And you all did such a great job of really hitting on those important words of respect and equality and um, really feeling valued in the school community. And all of those things are such important pieces of emphasizing communication and really threading that through all of the interactions and all of the offerings that you put into your school community every day. So all communication really does need to be expressed with the utmost emphasis on building that positive rapport, always using positive, not deficit language, and by maintaining respectful and courteous interactions. So next, we're going to take a quick look at some of the barriers to successful communication. And of course, there are far more barriers, in fact, than what are listed on this slide. Um, however, we did want to touch on some of the uh, basic and the most common barriers that we encounter in our school communities. So contact information that is inaccurate or outdated, that gets very frustrating for both the families and for our teachers and school staff when they're trying to communicate, as is difficult to access uh, information. So when we require families to click through like five different web pages before they're able to find the email link for their child's teacher or their related service provider, that's really not useful. And that gets equally frustrating for teachers when they go into the education portals that we're using and they haven't been updated with the most recent family contact information. And this is a specific barrier that becomes even more heightened in our school communities where families may be moving frequently, um, you know, there may be changes of location changes of address, um, children may be living between multiple homes, um, so this becomes even more important. Another frequent barrier to communication is the absence of a school-wide systemic communication policy. 
communication may not be put at the forefront of education unless it is specifically identified within our school policy. And I know that I have worked in many programs in my time where communication, other than maybe how people were supposed to be accessing the net and what they couldn't couldn't do, wasn't really outlined as being a priority and what was expected you know, from all stakeholders. So communication should not be present only in education policies, but it really has to be well-defined in the policy and in the practice, really, of what we're doing every day. And establishing those policies is an excellent and noteworthy achievement. You know, this, again, as we've said, and it was so nicely highlighted in Jamie's video and in the conversation today, this doesn't happen accidentally. This is not an incidental um, occurrence. It's something that's really purposeful. But this needs to be something that has time dedicated to it. So teachers must have time not only to communicate with families, but also to document the communication. And in the event that this is part of the educational policy, um, that really needs to be noted. So lack of time is often one of the things that is highlighted as being a barrier to many of the initiatives for family engagement, and communication is no different. There needs to be time made for that. So the question becomes, how do we break down these barriers? So we need to take a more systematic approach to communication. So from an administrator's point of view, establishing effective home to school communication can be one of the most fruitful approaches that we can take to establishing those strong partnerships that we've been talking about. Frequent communication is beneficial to our families because they gain more insight into what's happening with their children's education, and they develop confidence as equal educational partners, right, exactly what Jamie was talking about. And for our educators and our school staff who benefit from the knowledge that they gain about their students' life experiences, it's also beneficial. Relationships become more collaborative and also from our administrative perspective, much less litigious when we have a positive rapport that's been developed through communication. But again, effective communication is not accidental, it's not haphazard, it's the result of a purposeful and coordinated effort that's consistent over time. It takes this systematic approach to school communication to ensure success, and we begin by frequently connecting with our families and collecting information regarding their communication preferences. We really need to target what's going to work well within our individual school community. So while it's always a good idea to provide information in multiple modes, that could include flyers, emails, social media posts, texts, phone calls, even you know, hard copy letters home, communication surveys should be updated frequently in order to identify changing trends in communication use and what the preference of our school communities are. Families can be asked also about how often they're utilizing district websites and other means of communication. As administrators, we can also be taking steps to ensure that communication information, such as phone numbers, email addresses, et cetera, are regularly updated for all of our students so that we know that it's set when teachers and staff go to contact families, that that connection is going to be taking place successfully. Additionally, the district needs to constantly update school-wide information, including staff roles, teachers' phone numbers and emails, contact information for tech support, and other critical information. There is nothing so frustrating as attempting to reach out to your child's teacher and finding that the contact information has changed without your knowledge, right? I know that many of us who have, our parents have had that experience. And a successful administrator puts the policies into place to guarantee that such changes are, new, are recorded immediately and identify who is responsible for this task. And like any new initiative, establishing communication guidelines is going to require our support. So we can assist our teachers in establishing frequent ongoing communication by providing educators with the time and tools necessary to initiate that communication. And sometimes we can benefit from digital platforms such as Remind, Class Dojo, and others like them. And we really want to consider how these platforms can enhance communication between our homes and schools. We can also recognize that our teachers and our families may require training in order to use these communication platforms. And again, that's going to require time. And we also have to have a plan for how we'll be able to support them learning these new skills. 
Another significant step to creating this systematic approach to communication is recognizing that not every family will be able to access the same types of communication and to express this belief to school staff. Staff needs to be directed um, that they have to individualize and personalize communication based upon the needs of their students and their individual families. So as we prepare for communication, as we saw expressed on the previous slide and in the video with Jamie, effective communication, again, does not happen accidentally. So as we prepare for the school year, as administrators, we want to survey our families. We want to find out about those preferred communication types. What is their access to technology and the internet? What social media sites do they use most often? We want to take a communication audit of our staff. What techniques are they using to communicate with their classroom families? How successful have those attempts been? If we find out that our teachers are having great success, for example, with Class Dojo, then we might want to extend that platform school-wide. When we're preparing for communication, we want to emphasize that importance of positive communication, like Dr. Geibel was talking about earlier. We want to begin the school year with a phone call or a letter home by way of introduction, or even in some instances, a home visit, if that's a possibility, that allows our families and our teachers to be introduced to each other in a positive way, as opposed to meeting because there is a problem. And I feel like this cannot be overstated. Beginning that relationship on a positive footing and really establishing those lines of partnership and communication from the very beginning when everybody is invested in the beginning of a great new school year and getting to know one another before any challenges occur is paramount. And educators should maintain positive communication with family throughout the school year, preferably at a rate of three or four communications that are positive to one that expresses a challenge or a problem that may need to be addressed. I can personally tell you as both a former preschool teacher myself and a parent of preschool age twins, one of whom is autistic, it was pretty jarring to me when our son began school this year and we had very little communication from his program. It wasn't what I was used to doing as a teacher or an administrator and I had to collaborate with our team to establish expectations for communication on all ends so that we knew how we were going to be collaborating and communicating with each other throughout the year. So it really does make a huge difference. As administrators, we can model this behavior by providing positive feedback to staff and students on a regular basis, and we can require teachers to indicate the communication type that they've used to get in touch with families. We may want to instruct our staff that even if a school tends to emphasize a certain communication type if, and our families are different, we need to flex and meet our families where they're at and ensure that we're tailoring our communication to their needs. Some families may be unresponsive to emails and that's okay. We'll need to reach out to them in other ways. We also need to consider the content of our communication. Most of us, we don't want to receive troubling news like a medical diagnosis in a text. And a parent doesn't want to get a, an important piece of news such as a special education diagnosis in such a format. So really think about what is the need of the family when we're selecting the way in which we're going to be communicating with them. So again, this is a lot of information and it's a lot to do to create a more systematic approach to communication, right? And I would add that as administrators, we also need time to be able to work on this as a program priority. We know that time is the true currency. We can never have enough of it and they're never gonna make any more of it. So this really becomes an opportunity for us to work smarter and strategically. Collaborate with colleagues in different buildings and districts, especially those that mirror the characteristics of your school community. How are they handling communication with their families? What's worked well for them and what hasn't? Sometimes we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Maybe we just need to get a new set of tires, right? So now we come to the area that is really near and dear to my heart, which is accessibility. My background is as a teacher and administrator in programs for students who are deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind. So I've spent a lot of my career examining and problem solving issues of accessibility for students, staff, and families. One of the facets of family engagement that I find is most often an afterthought or sometimes it's overlooked entirely is accessibility. And in this context, I would submit that accessibility is a broader umbrella that encompasses both our traditional understanding of disability accommodations, as well as informed quality support for inclusion of our home languages. The simple truth, it's that families can't engage in what they can't access, whether that's because their child's school is only offering materials and programming, 
and, and actually also opportunities for volunteering in English or because they may have disabilities that require accommodation. It's important to remember that the power dynamic exists and that exists between schools and families. Not all families will feel comfortable requesting accommodations or asking for interpreters and translated materials. The onus is on us as the educators and program to be thoughtful and anticipate their needs. We should be making these primary considerations when developing our family engagement practice and planning activities and not attempting to tack them on as an afterthought. So how do we ensure access for all families? We can begin by identifying our key communicators from the families in our school communities. So who are our key communicators? If we know the demographics of our student and family populations, then we want to establish strong working relationships with several of the parents and family members who are integrally involved within their respective larger communities, be those cultural or linguistic communities or communities of a shared disability status. Their input and involvement in all levels of our family engagement planning and practice is invaluable. Conducting a needs assessment to determine what is required with regard to access is always a good first step to ensuring that in addition to approaching materials and programming from a universal design perspective, we are targeting additional supports to meet the needs of families in our school communities. When looking at access services, we need to establish protocols for securing interpreting and translation services that employed qualified interpreters and translators who have experience working in school age settings and are familiar with the specialized terminology and concepts that are common in our programs. We don't wanna wait until we need documents and materials translated or need meetings and programs interpreted to start figuring out the process. And again, I know that many of us have to use AI-generated translations at times, such as those that are provided by Google Translate, but we want to be mindful that while that's okay for some informal purposes, the accuracy and quality of these translations may not be of the level needed by school programs to ensure that clear and full communication is taking place with families in more formal settings and for legal purposes. And while high quality services are expensive, and we know that money is the other currency that we never have enough of, costs can sometimes be mitigated through the language consortiums and relationships with agencies and organizations that provide reduced costs for education entities. So approaching family engagement through a universal design for learning lens becomes a very important component of all of this. Questions to ask can include, when producing materials, are these available in accessible formats for our family members with vision needs? Do we automatically produce materials in quality translations of the languages most commonly used in our school community without our families having to ask? When we are planning programs, are we using the information from our needs assessment to provide multiple methods of participation with any accommodations that may be required? Are quality closed, closed captions being added to any media our school community is producing? Are captions provided for meetings, conferences, performances, and other programs? Are appropriately qualified language interpreters being provided for all school events, not just required meetings and conferences, to ensure inclusion of all families in our school community, regardless of home languages, including deaf or hard of hearing family members who communicate using sign language? Finally, there should be a process in place by which you seek feedback from families regarding their access experience in your school community and evaluate what changes can be made to ensure that all families are being meaningfully included. We recognize that everybody has competing priorities and when there are so many things to do and remember, it's understandable that sometimes we just get reduced to ticking boxes, right? We just wanna make sure it's all getting done. But it is crucial to ensure that when we're talking about accessibility and inclusion, we are really looking to our families to ascertain the extent that they feel that their level of engagement is meaningful and valued. And some of you put literally those words in the chat earlier. So again, can't overstate the importance of those and the degree to which they feel the sense of belonging in the school community. And on that note, I hand it back to Dr. Geibel. Thank you so much, Tara. Tara has such wonderful viewpoints on family engagement from so many different lenses. I just love listening to her talk. So when we're looking at websites or when we're looking at welcoming families, I apologize, we can't 
only examine the way we're interacting with people face to face, right? We also have to see what our presence is online. So our school website might be that first means of communication that is encountered by any families either within our school or who are potentially hoping to become members of our school community. As such, we really need to look at our website and ensure that it is welcoming all of our families. So when we are looking at the website, we want to seek to engage families from the very first view of the homepage. And one of the things that we should have included within that first view is the school's vision and mission, vision and mission, or any priority goals that you might have as a school community, right? So when we are looking at that, we want to ensure that our, our website, that first page is visually appealing, it's user friendly, um, it's easy to navigate, it puts what's most important on the page, our priorities, it expresses, you know, the goals that we want to be achieving within our school. Um, we also want to ensure that our website demonstrates a commitment to family engagement. So it should do this overtly by speaking about family engagement, about the importance of partnerships between home and school. But we can also um, think of it as, as our commitment to family engagement, again, making it an easily accessible website. Because as Tara was saying, you know, it's, there's nothing more frustrating than looking for the contact information for your parents, teacher, or for your child's teacher and not being able to locate that. And that's true. That's where our website can help us, right? By providing the most updated information. We can also include a parent or family page, depending on the verbiage used within your, your LEA. We encourage the use of family, since as we said earlier, all families are different. Um, is there a page that we could really make um, pertinent to families, provide them with information that they really need to know? We also want to follow a policy of easy navigability by thinking about how many clicks the family would need to access information. So one easy rule of thumb is three clicks. If we can access something in three clicks, so maybe that's three different pages, um, maybe it's two pages and it connects to another resource, um, that is much easier for families to navigate than if they have to go through a large series of of clicks and progress through a large number of pages. We also want to make sure in our website that we are portraying a variety of students and a variety of educational activities in order to reflect the diversity of our school population. Really important. Our website should be demonstrative of everything that we do and everyone that we serve. We also want to ensure, and this is piggybacking on what Tara said, so, so important, that we are complying with the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, for accessibility. So we need to make sure our website is accessible by individuals who are blind and deaf and who navigate the page using a screen reader or other assistive technology. So luckily, we as school administrators typically don't have to create the website, right? Uh, that's usually not our job. Maybe that's our IT department. Maybe that's someone that we contract from outside, but it is our job to set policies to maintain that site. So we're gonna move forward to the next slide. When we are serving in that capacity that we are working on website maintenance, um, we need to ensure communication with our web designer and to do so regularly. So you might be working under a lot of different, um, different website uh, designers or the people who supply your website might be different. It might be through an organization, it might be a separate contractor, this all looks quite differently. But what you want to do as an administrator is to establish a regular pattern of communication with that designer. Um, we need to make sure that we have their information and can contact them in order to uh, express any concerns we have with the website. We also want to collect and analyze website data, which can usually be done through the analytics within a site. We want to identify staff.
review this content and update it, emphasize easy access and search engine optimization. That is a whole phrase, search engine optimization. So make sure you talk about that. Um, it's how we get from place to place. Include comments and testimonials. So the real uh, meat of what we're doing. And we want to be able to connect to other networks and social media sites. So build connections within our site. And moving forward. Um, we also want to make sure we're empowering our families. So we realize we only have a few minutes left, but this is an important topic. Families should have a, a say in what they want to see for their children in education, what they want to see for the website, how they want to communicate. Survey your families about relevant topics. Inform them about the topics that are relevant to them as well. So make sure they are able to make an informed opinion. Include family members in all decision-making teams. This is important. Otherwise, it can really get you into some hot water if you haven't let families have their voice. Um, they have great ideas. Establish focus groups, family advisory teams, family networks, parent cafes, whatever you need to do to get that conversation flowing. And then meaningfully engage your families in academic and special education discussions. When we engage families in decision making, our first step needs to make to be that our staff is ready to work with them. <laughs> so make sure that your staff is prepared to include families in all decision making. Value families as those partners and institute family inclusion and decision making at every level. So whether it's classroom, school wide, district, looking at special education, regular education, the goals and priorities of your of your school and community um, and use team meetings as an opportunity to determine strategies that are going to work for you as an LEA. All right, steps for decision making. First of all, we need to prepare our students and families, inform them of what they need to know. If we're in a meeting, we have to orient the meeting to that purpose and process. So we don't want to, you know, let it flow off in a different direction. We need to have a purpose. We need to listen to and clarify participants' concerns and, and block blame. So uh, meetings for decision making shouldn't be about blame, but rather about problem solving. We want to validate and check for consensus and share concerns and expand solution ideas. So when we have a great idea, can we run with it? And then probably most important, set up an action plan or follow-up plan before you leave. This is a step that we leave out sometimes, and it's hard to initiate change unless we have that plan already set up. So make sure we get that on board. Okay, so I have here just a series of strategies there are many, many strategies for family engagement. There are just a few of them mentioned here, um, including home visits, student-led IEPs. All of these are hyperlinked. We've talked about how important it is to include families in decision-making. If you want to initiate some of these changes within your LEA, take these strategies back to your families. Figure out what's gonna work for them. Their opinion will be really vital in making these decisions. So when you do get this PowerPoint, you have all the hyperlinks to all these different strategies right there available for you. So we have reached the end of our session. So this is our time to fill out that, that second column in that um, Google, Google Doc that we had available if you have access to it and if you, you've been able to think of something. What strategies or approaches have you learned about today that you plan to implement next school year? It is springtime. We're looking forward till next year. Um, what do you think you want to implement that we've learned today? And we welcome you to add that into that second column of the Google Doc. And this is something we'll probably revisit at our next sex session as well so you can think on it over the next few weeks. And I'm going to turn this over to Kim now to finish us, finish us up. Thank you, Jennifer. I just want to share now the last slide. This is for Act, 40 hour, Act 48 credit hours. Um, the survey link will be open until 5 p.m. on April 16th. You can access it at this link here. If someone would please put that in the chat for me and or use the, um, the QR code on the screen uh, for easy access. Again, we need you to um, complete that if you're looking to receive any credit for attending this session. So thank you so very much for joining us. Um, you have been very um, engaged in the, and we appreciate all your participation as we've been going through the slides. Um, and you can reach out to 
um, any one of us on the family engagement team um, for any further questions or comments, or if you have um, individual family engagement needs that you'd like um, us to help you with, we're more than happy to assist you. And all you need to do is reach out to us. So I'm gonna leave this, um, the code up for a second and then I will switch to the very last slide, which is our, uh, contains our email addresses. So again, thank you for your participation and we hope you're able to join us um, on day two or part two of, the, of this training, which I believe is on May the 3rd. Thank you. And Kim, we did have a couple of people asking how we get the slides. Did you wanna talk about that real quick? Certainly. Um, the slides will be available in a handout um, on the patent. The session was recorded, so the recording will be available and all handouts on the family engagement page of the patent website. So and if, again, if you have further questions, please don't hesitate to contact any of us, um, any of the family engagement consultants listed on this slide or the other consultants um, who work in each of the offices.